Hey everyone, welcome to our first Ask Me Anything video. I'm Christy with StoneFamilyFarmstead.com and I teach people gardening, food preservation, and homestead organization at a beginner level. I'm Shelly with Rock and Debbie Homestead. I teach people how to garden in small spaces and to homestead wherever you live. I'm Mindy at Our Inspired Roots and I teach people how to homestead for better health. A few weeks ago, we each gathered questions from our readers on some of the biggest pain points that readers had on the topic of how to combat pests naturally in our vegetable gardens. So this AMA video on natural chemical free pest control is our answer to all those pain points. So for ease and quickness, we're going to answer your questions in a round robin type format where each of us reads a question and then answers it. So let's get started. Our first question, um, actually it's two questions and we're all going to answer them. So the first question is, do you use different natural remedies for different plants or just one main one? And the other one is, I'm truly worried about the damage on my plants. Most of the chemicals I use in controlling pests have not given me a good result. Are there organic pest control solutions that can be applied? Thanks. So I'm first, I guess. Um, first, I like to take my plants individually instead of treating my whole garden. So, so for me, I would only treat individual plants as they were needed and not add any, anything to my garden that wasn't needed. And then she said she was using chemicals to control pests. And so I would use as much organic that I could without putting chemicals in. And so we're going to talk a lot about that, all the organic ways that you can help keep pests out of your garden. So that's what I would do. Mindy, what about you? Yeah, I think that's good advice. Um, I think we also need to think about how we approach gardening, like organic gardening is a holistic approach. And so we want to make sure that all of the pieces are being addressed, like healthy soil, healthy plants. Um, you can do that by um, companion planting and rotating crops, making sure you put nice, healthy, um, high quality compost into your garden. And um, all of those things are going to help your garden just to be overall healthy so that hopefully you won't get too many pests. Of course, they will still happen occasionally, but that's the best first step. Yeah, um, I use different things every time, you know, just like the other lady said, you know, take each plant and each pest individually. I am often not using any chemicals at all. If I can, um, you know, smush the bugs or pick them off with my hands, that's usually what I'm doing. And, um, you know, if I have to, then I might use something um, that is uh, essential oil based, you know, whether it be something homemade or something bought. And so basically, it's just sort of on a case by case basis. Okay, I think I have the first question. Our reader says, we just bought a home in Southeast Arizona and there are loads of grasshoppers here. I, brought some in, I bought some insect barrier, which is a light cloth that covers the plants to keep the insects out. Do you have any recommendations for getting rid of grasshoppers naturally? And I definitely feel your pain. I have had grasshoppers take out a garden before. And in Texas, we have grasshoppers like this big. They they are sneaky things. And so the first thing I would suggest is that if you can encourage birds to come to your garden, because that's what helped me is that I had a flock of these birds we have called grackles. It came in and they ate every grasshopper in my garden and I didn't have trouble with it afterwards. So whatever you can do to bring birds into your, into your garden area, um, you might have to protect some things from the birds, but they're more of a benefit than they are a harm for you. So try that first. And then um, as far as grasshoppers go, you need to remove any of their hiding places where they would be hiding during the day. So you want to keep your garden area clean. And if you have any high grass, you want to keep it at a low level so that they don't have a place to hide. Um, you, you should till or turn your garden beds after the harvest so that they can't stay there and hide. And they also don't like onions, chives, and garlic. So rather than planting a bed of onions or a, a bed of chives, you should spread those out amongst your garden and that will keep them away from the plants because they don't like it. And then make a homemade pest spray. 
which is the standard one that people use because they don't like the taste of it. It's two cups of water, two garlic cloves, a teaspoon of liquid dish detergent, a teaspoon of salad oil, and two tablespoons of cayenne pepper. Put that all into a blender, puree it all up, and then put it in a spray bottle and spray it on whatever they're eating to deter them. Once they taste it, they won't want to come back. You also won't like the taste of that either. So before you decide to eat that, you, you're definitely going to wash it off and you're not going to want to um, spray it perhaps two or three days before you harvest. Okay, next up is Mindy. Actually, I had a, qu a question about that, Shelly. Yeah. How do you attract birds to your yard or to your garden? So they need a play. They need something to eat. They need some a house to be in. So they need a place to live, and they they need a water source. So as long as you provide those things, they'll they'll come into your garden. And that's a whole nother topic we could talk about. <laughs> we'll talk birds, but those are the three things they need: something to eat, they need a water source, and they need something to live in. Awesome. Okay, the next question is. Have you heard that if our soil and plants were at their optimum or in better health than the weeds, they would naturally deter pests and pests would attack the weeds? Awesome. Uh, my question is how to get rid of the roly poly bugs and slugs, of course, naturally. Um, we're going to talk about slugs later, but I'm going to talk about the roly poly bugs. Roly poly bugs eat decaying matter, so dead leaves, um, any fruit that's rotting on the ground. In small numbers, they're not really a big problem, but when you get a lot of them, then they start eating your seedlings and your fruit and all kinds of things. So when that happens, the best thing to do is to get rid of where they like to hide out. So damp, dark places. If you're using mulch, I would try to use something like wood chips that dries out a little better rather than like dried leaves um, because they, they tend to stay damp and the roly poly bugs really like that. Um, I'd also let my chickens in. Um, they like to eat pretty much any bugs. I think the only bugs that chickens, at least in my experience, don't like is squash bugs and stink bugs. So um, every other one they've enjoyed. Um, really cool trap that you can create is a potato trap, which is you just take a potato, cut it in half, and then you hollow out a little bit of the inside and you can plop that down on the ground, the hollowed part down and if you go out early in the morning and pull that potato up, you should have a bunch of roly-poly bugs eating the potato. And then you can throw the bugs to your chickens or do whatever you want with them. Um, but the, you know, if you put them all around the area, you should be able to get rid of them pretty quickly. And then diatomaceous earth will work. Um, Christy will talk more about that later, but it's always a last resort just because it can also affect other beneficials that are in the garden. So you want to make that kind of a last ditch effort. Yeah, so next question is, how do you find reliable sources for beneficials like ladybugs? So generally speaking, um, you can usually get ladybugs or praying mantis or green lacewing eggs um, at some mom and pop shops, other garden centers. Not usually the big ones in my uh, in my experience, but maybe in your area you can check there. But um, you can order the, those three online as well, or you can also order other beneficials like arachnids or nematodes um, through the mail as well. So there are some caveats to actually bringing in a whole colony of bugs, um, beneficials, into your garden. And um, one of them is that they can come in and completely eradicate the whole population of whatever it is you brought them in for and then just leave. So you will have, you know, spent your 15, 20 bucks or whatever, and they won't really stay around. And so um, they don't, I know in my area, I, I've done that a couple of times and I don't know if they are just like, Hey, we don't know this place. We're out of here, you know, kind of thing. So um, it doesn't usually work for me to do that. And also, um, there is another thing that I have read is that if you're uh, getting your beneficials from somewhere like across the United States or some other state or whatever, they may be acclimated to that particular uh, area in the state. 
or in the States, and um, they may not be used to, you know, where you're having them live, you know, so there's always that. I mean, it's really best just to try to uh, attract them to your garden before you ever have any problems. And um, then uh, that's a whole different topic or whatever, just like the birds thing. Maybe we should do something like that. In yeah. The <laughs> but, um, yeah, just trying to um, attract beneficials by planting things like um, morning glories for attracting ladybugs and hoverflies, goldenrod to attract ladybugs, assassin bugs, and parasitic wasps. Um, you can try planting aromatic herbs in time to attract beneficials that will prey on pests. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of different things that you can do. And also, uh, before you go to start trying to plant those things, make sure that they're good for your zone as well. So that's pretty much it. I think it's me. I'm also looking for a way to keep chipmunks and squirrels from eating my strawberries and vegetables. And this person lives in Maine. Um, those guys are sneaky and they, once they found your yard, they'll do whatever they can to eat your food. So one of the things, if you just want them to leave, the first thing that you could do is explore the idea of putting up a raptor perch or an owl nest box and use natural predators to get rid of them. And that, that perhaps is your most effective way. If you have a, a nut tree if, uh, in your yard, then that's why they're there. Like I have one in my front yard and there's, they live there, but they don't bother my garden because they're far apart the, in the front yard and the backyard. So perhaps you can put some space between them. If you know, you can't move your nut tree, but you could try that. You, if you have a dog, you just let your dog go out in your garden and they'll eventually learn that that's a place the dog will be. They also don't like nasturtiums, marigolds, and mustard. So if you plant a border around your vegetable garden of those things they don't like, they're less likely to cross over to get what they what you have in your garden. You could try that. You could try the hot pepper spray that we suggested with the grasshoppers so that you know if they don't like the taste of it, they perhaps will not come back. Many people take hot pepper flakes, like crushed red peppercorn that you put on your pizza, and they broadcast that in their garden beds where the squirrels are getting in. And then once they eat those, they'll be like, oh, I don't like that, and they won't come back. Um, and then if all that fails, you should try some kind of physical barrier. You, if you're going to put up a fence around your garden, you want to have holes that are less than two inches in diameter so they can't get through. And that's the same with rabbits. If you have trouble with rabbits, it needs to be small so that baby rabbits can't get through. You could make a cage to go on top of your bed, but squirrels can dig. So if you're going to do that, you want to bury it and then make some way that you can open the top to get into it for harvesting. That's a pretty good deterrent for them, but that's also pretty permanent. And so that's, I would say, a last resort. And then you could just try some of that lightweight plastic netting that you would perhaps put on your blueberry bushes to keep the birds off of them. Those, if you kind of scrunch that up and put it on your beds, it will still get light and water, but they won't like to get through that. And so that's another way you could deter them. So try any of those ways first and see what you can do. Cool. All right, I have the next question. It's best natural way to keep Japanese beetles from eating everything naturally. Traps are catching them, but there are too many. And how do you keep Japanese beetles, ants, and slugs out of the vegetable garden and strawberry patch? So ants and slugs we'll talk about later. So I'm going to focus on the Japanese beetles. So Japanese beetles traps use a sex pheromone to attract them, to attract the Japanese beetles. So you actually may be doing more harm having those traps. You may be attracting the ones from your neighbor's yard over here and from wherever over there. So first I would get rid of those traps. But since you already have an issue with them, you're gonna have to do more than that. So um, they're, Japanese beetles are invasive species from Japan. And so they don't have any natural um, predators. So really the only thing you can do is just like get your hands dirty. So the first thing that I would do is just pick them off and put them in soapy water. Um, it, that's sometimes just the best way to deal with them. You can also, I've put my chickens in 
in a an asparagus patch that had a lot of them. Um, so I just put my uh, my fencing, I have a like a movable fence around the asparagus patch and let them in there. And they did a pretty good job of eating those, but also there are Japanese beetles on, you know, up high, so the chickens can't quite get to all of those. So another thing you can do is get a like a soap and water spray and just you spray the bugs, you spray the leaves, everything that you can get it on there. They don't like um, the kind of slippery feel of the soap and water. Um, and then another interesting thing that I found is a fruit cocktail trap. So they said to open a can of fruit cocktail and let it ferment in the sun for a couple of days. And then you get a, a bucket of water and put the fruit cocktail right in the middle, um, up on a couple of bricks or something. And that attracts the beetles in, but then they go in, they drown in the water. Um, that's something you would want to keep a little bit away from your garden because you don't really want to attract them to your garden, but that's something that you could kind of track them away from the garden with. Um, but in my experience, picking them off and putting them in soapy water has been the best solution. Can I ask a question about chickens in the garden? Sure. So if you have a bug infestation, and you let your chickens in, will they leave your plants alone and go after the bugs instead? Do they prefer the bugs over your plants? I think so, but also, um, I mean, typically when you have a bug infestation, your plants are already established, mm -hmm. so you don't have like little seedlings. Yeah. So the chickens will pretty much leave those alone. I mean, they'll take a snack off of like the kale and, you know, whatever is there, but if, they're, if the plants are big enough, the chickens really won't do too much harm to okay. them. Good to know. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so our next question is about the pros and cons of using diatomaceous earth in the garden, when and how to use it safely to minimize impact to beneficials. And um, I'll also be dealing with black bugs on the underside of the leaves of squash plants. And there was another question about flea beetles on eggplants. And um, the person was not having a good, uh, good, any good luck with using diatomaceous on or diatomaceous earth on that plant. So we'll talk about that too. So the pros and cons first. So probably the biggest pro to using um, diatomaceous earth in the garden is that it's non-toxic. And so if you get it on your plants, you don't have to worry about whether or not you are uh, ingesting something poisonous to you. It's not, it's fine. But of course, you're gonna wanna wash your vegetables and fruits first. Um, you probably don't wanna eat it. Um, there is a food grade version, which is the one I recommend for a garden um, for that very reason. But um, there's also another um, version that you might find at your feed store, and you might think it's just such a great deal to get it from the feed store, but it's usually red in color, and basically it's mixed with clay, and you don't want to eat that, and you don't want to you know, put that somewhere where your animals can eat it. So um, it's called Codex. And so what, what we're talking about here is the white diatomaceous food grade um, version. And um, it can be used to keep bugs with exoskeletons away from your uh, plants like roaches or other unkind pests. But if you have abundant beneficials with exoskeletons like ladybugs, it's going to affect those too. So you're going to want to make it kind of a last resort thing. Even though it's non-toxic, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to use it where you're going to have um, some good beneficial bugs. And, uh, you know, if you, especially if you've attracted them to your garden before, you don't want to eradicate them too. So um, the cons, uh, that's one of the cons. But another con is that it's just not a set it and forget it type thing. So actually no natural pest control is. But um, for diatomaceous earth, you're going to have to reapply it every time it gets wet. So if you apply it around your plants and then you have like your drip system or whatever, um, you know, wetting around your plants, you're going to have to reapply it every day and you're going to have to do it, you know, for a good two weeks and you're going to have to really pay attention. So um, making sure that you reapply when you're actually dealing with the colony of bad bugs on your plants um, is what you're going to want to do. So I found that tr when I'm treating my garden for pests with any natural form of pest control, like I mentioned before, it just takes a concentrated daily effort of about two weeks. And then you can usually get a handle on it, at least, um, you know, really taking the, the uh, population down well enough that your plants can get hold and, you know, 
and get healthy again. But um, if you are spending, finding that after two weeks, you're spending more time than that, you're going to need to move on to something different. And that's the con with um, diatomaceous earth because it just isn't going to work, you know, um, as well as, you know, for an acute situation as like, say, you know, BT or something else like that. So another con is that you're gonna to have to be careful when applying it to plants if you're like, you know, just kind of um, dropping it onto your plants or whatever, that you're not gonna to wanna to kick up dust. Um, even though it's non-toxic and it's um, not a pesticide, um, it's unsafe for you to breathe in the crystalline uh, versions of it, which is what is included inside a pesticide product. So if you go to, uh, your garden center and you buy a diatomaceous or there, that's probably going to be the crystalline version. Just for the sake of safety, you know, even if you buy a food grade version, you know, that's supposed to be able to be eaten, still don't kick up dust with it because it can cause um, irritation in the eyes and cause respiratory issues for you and your animals. So you're going to want to know that. Okay, our last question is I can't keep the deer from raising my garden to the ground when the plants start getting a little bigger. I'm not gardening this year, so she wants to add this to her list of things she can do. And she wants some ideas for next year. So jump, deer can jump very high, seven or eight feet at no problem. The best way to keep them out of your garden is to build a strong fence around it. And it should be something that doesn't have any gaps in it. So even your garden, um, your entry and exit uh, gates, you need to be sure that you don't have any gaps wider than six inches or they'll be able to get through, which seems strange, but really they're, they're good at that. So if I was going to put in a permanent garden and I had trouble with deer, that would be the first thing I would do is I'd put eight feet fences and I would make sure that they were solid and tight so that the deer can't get through. You could put regular slatted fences so that they can't see through at all, and that might deter them. So that if you know at a at a shorter level, so that if they can't see what's inside, they they might not um, want to get through. They don't have very good eyesight. They smell better than they see. So if they can't see what's in there, they that might deter them. The University of Vermont has a, a really good website discussing all of these different fences you can put. Another thing uh, that you could do is there are these leaning fences. They lean at a 45 degree angle out from your garden and the, the um, well, I'll do it this way. They'll try to get in this way and then they'll get caught. That's going to cost some more money than putting up a regular fence. But uh, anyway, take a look at that. I'll put it in the show notes. And then you could also install nets around there so that if they can't get into them, the same kind of nets we talked about with the squirrels that you would put over for birds to keep out of your blueberries. If they can't get under it, because obviously they can't lift it up, they might stay away. Some people plant barrier plants around their gardens. So in addition to the, to the, um, fences so give them what they like and let them stop at the barrier plants feed them that so that they won't come into your garden and then I think we discussed this beforehand that um, we think that perhaps taking a year off from gardening might also deter them that they they found your garden but now it's gone and they might they might not come back as quickly so if you can do some of these other things to deter them in the future, that, that perhaps will help you. Um, if a deer is hungry, if, it's, if they're under stress, they're going to eat anything, and they're going to do anything to get to your garden. So whatever you can do to give them food outside of your garden is the best thing that you can do. And then, like I said, a tall fence to keep them out. That's it. So um, on my last question, um, I was supposed to address flea beetles, and I okay. forgot to, if that's okay, okay if I do it right now. Yeah. Okay, so I don't have any flea beetle issues, but the person who asked the question said that they were just going to give up on um, planting eggplant anymore because the flea beetles are just crazy every year. So um, you know what, let me encourage you, don't, don't stop you know, gardening eggplant. I totally get why you would do that, but here's a couple of ideas. 
um, because of the nature of the way that flea beetles are, you know, they just hop from leaf to leaf and they can carry disease and stuff like that. You want to deal with them more quickly than with diatomaceous earth. So um, that's probably the reason why you're having trouble. But um, what you can do to uh, prevent it is when you plant your eggplant um, seeds or transplants, you know, add row covers, you know, before they can even get on there. That way you can just block the whole thing from happening again. See how that works. And if you uh, already have the problem, like say you have uh, your eggplants right now in the ground and there's flea beetles, you can try neem oil. So that's um, all I have to say about that. And um, with that, we uh, are going to need to come back for a part two because we have so many more questions, you guys. And so we're gonna do a part two and that way we don't have to hurry through every single question. We can actually give you everything that we've learned and what we know. And so um, thank you so much for being here. And we hope that you have been able to get some of the answers to some of the issues that you're having in your garden. All the websites and products that we have mentioned, we will have um, links to those in the show notes. And also we will have the links to everywhere that you can find us on social media and at our blogs. And if you guys have enjoyed this video, please leave us a comment in uh, down below. And um, we would be more than happy to do this again with any homesteading topic. And so we'd like to hear your thoughts on what you'd like to see next after we're done with all the natural pest control stuff. So anyway, thanks a lot for being here. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.